And we're going to be talking to the head of the MPAA, the head of the Music Association, the head of the Video Game Association, Mike Smith, who you guys all know from Carnegie Mellon, and uh, Gene, who you guys also, also know from Independent Films. We're going to be talking about the impact of the fangs and platforms on the future of entertainment. So that's who we're talking to, and that is going to be their seated order. Although, are we missing somebody? Feels like maybe we're missing somebody. Uh, we lost. Uh, we lost somebody. Jan and Jean. We lost Delara. So Delara's here, but you're not on the slide. So this is the virtual Delara. She's a holograph. She's actually sitting here. She runs all of the video game space. She has very interesting things to say. She knows where to sit, but somehow the slide lost her. So uh, we apologize uh, about that, Delara, but uh, she is here. So um, everybody sit. I guess we need a couple more seats. Yep. OK, thanks. OK. So I like Brian. Um, I come from Brian's world, so we have the same jargon. So this notion of the fangs is also common in our, our, uh, my world. Uh, as a Wall Street analyst, and um, the FANGs stand for Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. And uh, so I, too, am an inter uh, also a fan of short introductions. So I'm just going to tell you who these people are. And actually, maybe I don't have to, because there they are, except for I have to read Delara's, because they forgot her. So um, let's see. Oh my god, your last name, Delara. OK. Delara. Uh, what is it? Okay, Delara Derekshani is the Senior Counsel for Tech Technological Policy at the Entertainment Software Association. And everybody else's titles are there. They're all very, um, have long and, and uh, very prestigious careers. And that is how they got into their current job jobs. So um, we're gonna start now, now that we're all set up. I guess they're working on setting them up. but. Jan's going to answer the first question, and we can start with him since he's ready to go. So um, let's start with power dynamics, Jan, um, and then we'll work our way down the, down the aisle. We used to say that content is king. Is that still true? Who's in charge now? Is it content or consumers or platform aggregators like the FANGs, such as iOS, Android, Spotify, Netflix, Roku, YouTube, Twitch? Which group has the most power today? Take it away. I think content is still king. I think okay. it's about great stories well told uh, across the globe. So I think that's kind of still a very strong uh, view, my side. Uh, I think consumers have more choices than ever right now, kind of streaming platforms all across the globe. There's more than ever. It's still expanding. Uh, streaming is kind of where it's going, that's for the good and the bad. So we are seeing some really bad trends in streaming as well, where you see new platforms popping up, being run by criminal enterprises, running illegal content sources, uh, making millions of dollars a month, something we are fighting uh, as MPAA every day. Uh, it's not kind of missing my title here. So I'm not running the MPAA, I'm running the MPAA's content protection unit, uh, which is our kind of daily job protecting studio content and making sure when it's out there and when it leaks out there, it's being mitigated. And a big uh, uh, part of my role is kind of mitigating uh, and fighting the leaks of uh, the great work our members are making. OK, Jean? Um, certainly content drives it all. Um, I think the, what's changed to some degree is to bring the content to the consumer today, you have to be format and platform agnostic. You have to understand how best to tell a story and how the story arc unfolds in the most convenient way for your consumers. Um, so it is still the case that a strong story and a good line and good production values will get you where you need to go. But the real issue is, does the audience find you? Do you have access to that audience? 
And more to the point, can you answer any of those questions prospectively rather than retrospectively? We all know in reverse what content could have worked or should have worked or didn't work or should have been on Netflix instead of trying to go to a cinema. The issue today is can you figure out as you put together the story you want to tell, what's the best way to get out there into the marketplace and to make sure you're heard? Mitch? So content is king uh, where platforms operate in the free market. Uh, where regulation has skewed that market uh, so that uh, you know, the power has shifted to the platform where they don't have to negotiate rights in the free market or where the price is depressed because they compete against each other because of exceptions and limitations. That so wait, what's your answer? Your answer is the platform because the government has yeah. messed everything up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, would say, I would say that there are two buckets. One bucket is Spotify, Apple Music, uh, Amazon Unlimited. They negotiate for prices in the free marketplace uh, and they get subscription revenue and the content is king in that environment. They have to negotiate for that. So in your world of music, content is king. Content is king on those so platforms. So where is the, the platform? the power has shifted in ad-based platforms that I see. user uploaded platforms where the Digital Millennium Copyright Act no longer allows that free market to operate. The power shifts from content to the platform. Because now they say, we're not going to pay you anything. Send us a notice. We send you a notice. Doesn't work. Pops up two seconds later somewhere else. There's no balance, which means content's not king in that environment. The regulation enacted in the 90s shifted the power to the platform unintentionally, but it did. So there's two buckets. Content's king in one. In yours, in, in music. Delara, they have found you. You've you got found your me. whole time. It's your <laughs> up, you for baby. Having me. Um, <laughs> uh, so, content is absolutely at the heart of what we do. Um, games take several years to develop. Uh, we have the budgets uh, comparable to that of Hollywood um, movies. Um, that being said, if you're not producing entertaining and worthwhile experiences for the customers, the customers are not going to play your game. They're not going to sign up for your service. They won't pay the subscription fees. They'll leave and they'll pick another service. Um, I'm going to add one more thing to your list, though, and that's the importance of broadband to video games. Mm -hmm. Video games are unique in that they are a little bit different from, from some of the, the other silos, I guess we can call them, um, in that they're interactive. Um, so we talked uh, about the importance of G's yesterday, right? Um, and uh, frankly, I, I mean, I think video games are a great use case for a lot of the conversation that took place yesterday. Um, the importance of low latency, high reliability, um, faster broadband speeds cannot be understated. Um, so I would say it's a mix of the three, but I would add broadband to that as well. OK, Mike. Let me, let me disagree respectfully with, with Jan on, on, on content as king and move more towards Mitch. I, I think one, one question you could ask is, why has content always been king? And I think a good deal of that was that the content creator and the rights holder could control access to the content and could say, you could only get access to my content if you agree to my terms um, and, and to my price. And I think piracy really shifted away from that world much, toward, much more towards, towards a world where the customer is king, because the customer could suddenly say, screw you, I don't want to pay that price. I'm going to steal it. Um, and so in a, in a content is king world, you develop business models based on control. But in the presence of piracy, those business models are really hard to execute. In a customer is king world, you develop business models based on, on convenience. And honestly, what we're discovering is those business models are really hard to execute, too, for content owners. So I think, I think piracy has really shifted the game in ways that are incredibly hard to respond to. So your answer is which one is king? Both. Both what? I think, I think we're living in, in a world where there's this, this serious tension between is, is content king or is customer king? And how do we design a business model based on those, those, that tension? OK, so I'm going to recap. He says content. She says content. He says content some, in his world, which is music, but if you, in the ad-driven world, he thinks it's the platforms. She says content, but broadband speeds are super important because games need two-way symmetric fast. And he says, he sort of says content and the consumer, sort of it depends. Um, the customer, it depends. So we have a platform, a consumer, and lots of content is king. 
I would say I think it's only the consumer because I think data is the most important thing. And if you don't have customer data, first party data, you have nothing. Because guys who have first party data know how they should program. And they, you don't know your content as well unless you know who's watching for how long. So I would say content is nothing without data, which means you have to have a first party relationship. That would be my re respectful opinion. But anyway, moving on, I am not on the panel. Um, I will call on each of you <laughs> to address this question. <laughs> We're gonna start at the other end. Mike, you're up first, followed by Delara. So regulators are now focusing on internet platform dominance. Looking five to 10 years forward, do you think that the internet allows more companies and voices to thrive or fewer voices compared to today? That is, do you believe the media space you compete in has transitioned to a winner take most markets or not? And who wins? So let's, let's go back to the content versus customer, right? If, if the customer's king, as the, the polar, polar ends of this, this panel believe, because of piracy, then I think you develop a business model based on convenience, right? So, so the idea, you know, why would I ever pirate if I, for 10 bucks I can get all the world's music and a platform that understands me well enough to give me a playlist that is this weird mix of classic rock, British ska, and, you know, Elton John, um, right? You know, that, that's, that's wonderful. The, the problem with that world, though, is exactly, Laura, what, what you're saying, is that to make that world work, you need to know, you need to make it really convenient for me to find stuff, which means you need to know a lot about my preferences. Um, and suddenly, the platform has huge economies of scale, not just in terms of the technology, but also in terms of customer data. The more data I get, the more, the more customers I get, the more data I get, the more data I get, the better I can recommend, the better I can recommend, the more customers I get. Um, but there's, there's one other thing that we don't talk a lot about, and that is there are also huge economies of scale in terms of aggregation. What the, what the economic theory says is for general types of content, the more content you have on the platform, the more valuable it's going to be to add an additional piece of content. So the bigger bundle should be able to outbid the smaller bundle. And for all those reasons, all those economies of scale, that means we're going to have a very small number of these, of these bundles, which is really lousy for, for, for content owners if you're not one of those bundles. Um, so think, your winner take most markets is your vote? Winner take most, and I think full marks are deserved for, to the studios for transitioning their business model from the content is king world to the customer is king world. Um, as we're seeing with Disney Plus and HBO Max and, and NBCU. Okay, Delara. Sure, so I think you, you, I think you may have asked, or we might have been talking about this last night, who ultimately wins. I do think that the customers ultimately do win in the video game space. Um, we, have, we have a lot of companies uh, competing in certain areas and yet also collaborating and cooperating in other respects. Um, we have new entrants into the market. At our annual show, E3, this year, back in June, uh, Google announced its new streaming service, Stadia. Um, uh, similarly, Microsoft has uh, uh, announced um, its upcoming project, xCloud. And the takeaway from these services, the common thing uh, among them, is that um, it allows you to take video game on the go, the ability to, to play where you want, when you want. Um, and I think this does lower barriers for those who can't um, uh, maybe afford uh, hardware. Um, and I think um, we can talk about trends later, but, but I think that's a really interesting direction that we're heading in. So more voices. You think technology I, I enables do. more and voices? Actually, there are, and I okay. can, I'm happy to, to talk offline or provide resources to anyone who asks after, but there are a lot of cases of individual small one-person developers whose content is being made available on a range of platforms, iOS, Android, um, PlayStation, Xbox, among others. So there are many examples of that. And so I, I hope and I, I do believe more voices. Great. OK, Mitch. In the free market world, more voices, more competition, lots of licensing, differentiation of services, uh, because the market will work. In the user uploaded ad based world, winner take all, hard to compete with one company uh, and less competition, less voices. So the minute it goes to advertising driven, which is free to the consumer, you end up with a few winners. Because of the regulations, yes. And because of the targeting that they have access to. There's only free. so many advertising dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Gene. Um, 
I think that we have to avoid being distracted by today's shiny object. I've been in this industry a very, very long time. And the history is always the same. Distribution ends up dictating what happens for a period of time. Um, and one of the things distributors want is to control what goes in their pipelines. And one of the things content producers have to have is those pipelines. It's a marriage that is wrought with fights and conflicts. It was true in cinemas. It was true on television. It was true on cable. And it was true on, and it's true on the internet. At the end of the day, um, this is much more about who gets close to the consumer. And in the winner-takes-all analogy, you sort of ignore the fact that consumers are famous for walking away from today's form of distribution. That's what they did to music when the internet made piracy possible. That's what they did to cinemas when TV happened. So I think the jury is really out on how this all plays out. And I would go back to if you are, as my, produce, as my companies are, producers of content, the way you play this one out and the long game is you make the best content you can. You fight as hard as you can, not just for the major platforms. But I mean, for heaven's sakes, there are 5,000 VOD platforms in Europe. There are a lot of directed platforms that have their audiences that will hold those audiences a lot longer than Netflix. And you know, let's see where we are in five years as to which of these big platforms have managed to retain critical mass yeah. as competition to those distribution mechanisms rise. Um, but for content creators, I think that it's a very hard period of time now as everything tries to consolidate and go into vertical integration. But the reality is I suspect my members will still be standing producing content long after this particular magic drama of does Netflix succeed over Disney Plus plays itself out. So more voices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jan. More voices. I think the jury is out indeed. Um, we are seeing a lot of illegal competition and while you're, see, you're seeing splintering of different platforms uh, going forward with their own content in a, in, a, in a kind of a splintered way, we are seeing these kind of illegal aggregators of content combining everything together. Uh, and that's serious competition to kind of whatever whatever is going to happen over the next five years. So we are kind of looking at at least 800 players across the globe um, aggregating content of all the known players, MPA members, but it's not limited just to MPAA members. It's, it's much broader than that. It involves sports, it involves music, the smaller independents. These guys are marketing different and at a price point you cannot compete with because they're not paying any license fees. $20, you get everything. So I think the jury is out, but it's very important that we focus on these bad actors to make sure the marketplace stays clean and also clean of malware, viruses, and other issues uh, uh, that are out there. Um, Mitch, I, I want to recap what people said, but one of the things you said was that you see this like sort of bifurcated world. There's more voices in sort of your world and less voices in ad-driven. But can you really argue in music there's more voices? Because I sort of feel like Pandora's going out of business and John Malone bailed them out by having Sirius buy them. And really, it's just Spotify. So do you can you show evidence that there's more voices? Yeah. For your, OK, yeah. where? Um, I mean, globally, there are 400 plus licensed services that are competing, and all of them have all music. So it's, you know, they have to differentiate themselves. But if you just look at what's happened between Amazon Unlimited versus Amazon Prime and the, the bundle with, you know, the Echo, uh, which happens on all the other home devices, too, where uh, you're in your living room and you say, Alexa, can you play this song? And Alexa plays the song, or Alexa says, I'm sorry, that's not included with Prime, but since I have your credit card information for $4.99 a month, you can play any song you want on this particular device in this living room. That's a great example of differentiation at a lower price point for a particular service in a particular place that you might pay for in addition to your $9.99 a month on Spotify, which you could listen to if you want to hook it to Alexa as well. There's also Deezer, there's also Tidal, there's also Apple Music. 
uh, besides the two parts of Amazon. So there's a huge amount of competition for people who are arguably offering the same type of music because they're appealing to the customers in different ways or they're offering different types of services at different price points. And that's just in the United States. And there's a fierce competition for global markets within those big companies and also within tons and tons of local companies. India is a very good example where there was a recent you know, merger of two Indian companies that are taking Spotify and Apple Music on you know, head to head. And in music, a lot of repertoire is very, very local. And it's in local languages, and it's in different yeah. dialects. And sometimes the lo those local services figure out how to appeal to consumers in different ways. So I think as long as you have a free market, it's an incredibly robust licensing environment. The minute, at least in the US, that you turn to a regulated environment mm -hmm. where rights are not as secure and the power shifts mm -hmm. and you no longer have to pay market prices because you can say, send me a notice, by the way, it doesn't work. That's when you end up with the problem. Okay. All right, so let's recap what the vote was here. So Mike thinks it's winner take most. More, more voices, fewer platforms. Oh, so am, I am I allowed to? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's more, more creative voices on fewer, very powerful platforms. Okay, Winner take most voices. on the platform okay, side. All right, okay, hold on. So more voices, more voices. Uh, depends, again, generally more voices in his space and what he sort of means by more paths to the consumer, which allows more voices because you can demand any song you want. Um, Gene is more voices, um, uh, but it, because history has shown that these sort of big monopolists sort of fail over time by new technologies coming in. And also, uh, Jan, more voices. And I would definitely say platforms win, so I would disagree with all of you. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> moving on. Okay, uh, last question to the, um, and anybody could jump call, but I'm gonna call on all of you so you can answer in whatever order you want. Um, let's drill down on platform conflicts. Thinking about platform aggregators like iOS, Android, the MVPD, Spotify, Netflix, Roku, YouTube, Twitch, are the platform aggregators building or hurting small businesses in the US? For example, Google sorts its travel services above booking.com and TripAdvisor's paid ads, and Apple's apps are pre-installed on its iPhones. What are the platforms doing in your space that seems unfair, and what is the role of platform accountability? Anyone can take it, but all of you are going to have to answer. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it was interesting when Macon was up here talking about the fact that when Congress enacted in the context of 230 and the DMCA was enacted at the same time, and they're both basically complete liability exemptions for user uploaded platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, he basically said, you know, Congress couldn't have and didn't anticipate the types of platforms that exist today when it enacted that, that law. And to me, platform accountability means when you're in an interdependent environment, which we are now, we need the platforms, the platforms need us. Uh, there should be incentives for platforms to act accountably to keep clean marketplaces to compete effectively because that at the end of the day will help everybody. It will help us and the platforms because there's more revenue coming in, more content coming in, and there's a long-term viability for all of us. In the short term, there's always this temptation to use those liability exemptions to you know, maximize the next deal yeah. in a way that can, be un non or that, that can be unfair to competitors who are in a different situation. You're an ad-based service, you're offering basically the exact same service. You know, if you're, if you're YouTube, you're offering the same service as Spotify. You're both publishers, let's face it. You're both taking content, you know exactly what's on your platform, you are finding and recommending it to consumers on whom you have data and pushing it to that consumer. That's called publishing. You take content, you know what it is, you push it to a particular consumer but they operate under different rules. That causes a lack of fair competition. And so to me, accountability means not trying to take advantage of that situation, working with incentives in the marketplace for long-term survival. And it can be done voluntarily. It doesn't have to be a change in the law. It will be a change in the law, ultimately, whether you're talking about the DMCA or 230, if people don't self-regulate in a way to create fair competition. But it doesn't have to be yet. Okay, Gene. Um, first, I wanted to comment a bit on, on what 
Mitch has said, and then I have a few other things to say. First of all, I am not a proponent of self-regulation or voluntary programs. It would be nice if that were true, but in response to the question of what do you think is fair and unfair, I think the fact that Google, in its great excess of wonderfulness, has decided to create a content ID program to solve this particular notice and takedown problem, but refuses to make it available to small creators, is in and of itself unfair, anti-competitive, and a clear sign of why total self-regulation doesn't work. It aligns with where they view their greatest economic interest is. And the fact they can go to a small creator, and, and by small, I don't mean the little guy in his basement. I mean 20-year veterans who have 500 titles in their library and say, no, we won't give you this program. You can't take down your illegal content permanently. But we'll give you this other program where you agree to license your content to us and leave it up. And we'll pay you a few pennies of advertising dollars. I'm sorry, you shouldn't have to choose between allowing an exploitation you did not authorize and having the same tools that everyone else has to protect your content from illegal um, competition. So I am very dubious. I believe industry, the in, joint industries have to be involved in figuring out what the voluntary mechanisms, what the mechanisms should be. Okay. But at the end of the day, if there is not a government imprimatur on that, I do not believe the small players will be treated fairly. Um, so that, that's sort of the first thing. In terms of unfairness, again, the small creators at this moment really feel like this, the jilted prom date. We made these platforms go. They took our content for everything. And now they don't want us. And putting that sense of just I wanted to go to the same big party you did. Um, <laughs> off to one side, there are an, a, a number of ways in which the platforms just pour salt in the wound. Mm -hmm. uh, lack of data is one of the big issues. Um, I agree with that. We know they don't share it yeah. much. But even, at least for us, I don't know about the studios, but at least for us, our members can't find out how their content is done on these platforms except by a private phone call. They won't put it in writing. They won't give you any broader information of context. But if you have a good friend in the sales department in the platform, they may tell you how your content did. I'm sorry, that's crazy. They're using that data to choose what content they buy. They're using that data to choose what country they will release your content in and how they'll support it. Um, to not be sharing that with the very people who are providing the content is both a problem in terms of how you shape the marketplace, but it's also a problem because, of course, all the, the platforms are now using that data to determine what content they themselves will produce. So it's, you know, it's certainly being used in a, a way that affects competition downstream. Um, I think there are a variety of other issues that come up, but the, the big one for all of us over the last five years really has been the, the unwillingness to control piracy, the unwillingness to work fully and openly with all of us about mechanisms that would get content down. The con we know the technology is there today to do takedown, stay down. We know it's there. Um, but the platforms will not come to the table in an open way to begin to address any of that. And I think that's one of the, the, I mean, that factor alone has wiped out the profitability of a number of countries around the world, Spain being the first and most, most extreme example. Um, and at this point, I think we all just view that whole area of competition as being a situation in which it will come back to bite the platforms, but they're being very slow to work with us to, okay. to resolve it. May I respond and, and respectfully disagree? Go. Yeah, respectfully um, disagree. So, so in our... Or disrespectfully, I don't mind. <laughs> really? Yeah, okay. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say. Oh, um, so in our experience, uh, I, you touched on the interdependence inter of, of the, some of these 
relationships. Um, and I'll just reiterate um, the importance of collaboration and cooperation, but also that some of these platforms are actually um, releasing transparency reports. And I, I feel like this might be something new, um, but- you know, Google's been doing it for five years, maybe? So do you find those to be helpful or not? not no, not okay. particularly, because the transparency reports actually don't tell you how your product performed, mm -hmm. which is the information people want. We do know the piracy statistics to some degree because all of our companies employ services that measure that. So the transparency reports really, they give you a lot of information, but they don't give you the competitive or the commercial information that people want as they make decisions about whether or not to invest millions of dollars into new content. And that's really the, the data that I think we're all focused on. Okay, so Dillard, do you have anything else? Uh, another dis uh, dis <laughs> respectful <laughs> point to disagree. Um, just, uh, I would challenge the idea that self-regulation doesn't work, period. Um, in the video game industry, um, the Federal Trade Commission has um, uh, lauded our self-regulatory system, albeit in the um, context of ratings, uh, the entertainment software rating boards uh, uh, self-regulatory program as, as the most excellent in the entertainment industry, perhaps not in those words, most excellent. But um, so I would, I would just challenge that. Um, but I think that's an excellent, that's, a different issue, that's an excellent point that's though, fair. because in the, on the media, in the media industry, both the Motion Picture Association and the video game uh, industry, in order to avoid the government acting, mm -hmm. self-regulated to prevent, so that they could control and bring to the consumer enough information to sort of fend off the regulators so that at the end of the day, they didn't have to worry about the government overdoing it or doing it in a way that would hurt their ability to serve consumers properly. And I think that that's an excellent lesson for platforms, which is, you know, you really can be, be accountable. You really can come to the table and work with people together. It's a little late for them. And, and you can avoid, <laughs> I mean, late. but you see what's happening now. And I know people don't want to call it tech lash. Some people, it was such an interesting conversation yesterday because uh, the conversation afterwards, some people were saying is, oh my God, do these people just have their head in the sand? Like they're just denying <laughs> that there's a lash. I mean, that 13 attorneys general, you know, then, you know, announced that they were investigating. And other people were like, no, it's, it's more than a tech lash. Like, it's, it's already too far over the hill. But I do think that the media companies self-regulating a long time ago is a good lesson. But I think the point of that lesson is that that started when government stood up and said, either act or we will. Well, I think and they're doing really it. And that's really my point. And I think, I think that, it. so I think, yes, I agree that I think I had said this actually, that industry has to be involved in figuring out what the, the rate, what the system is and what the rules are. But at the end of the day, the people who have to carry that out have to know that government w themselves will hold them accountable if they don't do it. And that hasn't really happened yet on the okay. piracy front. Mike or Jan, you wanna weigh in? I wanted to weigh in on the data question. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm worried that if you're a content creator and you actually get the platform to share data on your content with you, it's gonna be a Pyrrhic vis victory at best. Um, so they're gonna tell you, you know, here's how many people are watching your content, here's when they're watching it, you know, great. Um, but you're only gonna see your content. Um, what, what the platform's gonna maintain is what that person did on everybody else's Well, content. and that's a big issue, Mike, and yeah. I totally agree with that, and it's the, where that's gonna play out. This is very interesting. The EU has just legislated that the platforms are gonna have to make data available, not to the producers, interestingly enough, but to the creators, to the authors and performers, and it's un so that they can evaluate the value of their own contributions. And of course, those of us on the producer side opposed all of that because we feel we should be the, the center point. But more to the point, we can't get that data. So there's gonna be a real interesting tug of war as to what data is made available, and as you say, is it limited to that one title yeah. and one very narrow thing, or does it become broader? But again, I think this is an area in which a broader discussion needs to take place. I'm convinced a lot of the data is useless, but um, because consumer tastes change so much, it's not that we wouldn't want to get our hands on it, but um, there needs to be more understanding of what the data is and what it's used for. 
and a broader sense of what needs to be made available. Okay, Mike, do you have more? Oh, just I, I think the, the, the real thing, though, is you're never going to get access to that individual consumer. Right? So what, yep. what you're going to get is this anonymous exactly. consumer watched this part of your content, but you don't know anything else about yep. what, what, they, what else they watched. Yep. And by the way, you can't talk to them. Yeah. Um, you only know like 50 guys watching. Mm -hmm. You don't know which 50 guys and how it overlapped the last 17 things. Yeah, it, and that's what I think is so important. We're, we're looking at data like it was like we were still in a broadcast television world. Or in a world. Nielsen world. Exactly. Yeah, irrelevant. we're looking at data like Nielsen when we should be looking at it like, like the platforms like Facebook. do. And I guess yeah. my reaction to that is I would like the choice of whether that data is useful or not. I totally agree with you. I can hypothesize from here till doomsday as to how useless they can make what they give us. <laughs> but I'd really like to see it in the first instance. OK, Jan, you're up. I don't have a lot to add, I, I think. I mean, I think in general, many of these bigger players are good players. They are helpful in certain ways to kind of mitigate piracy on their platforms, and some can be more proactive. I, th I think it's still crazy that we need to flag a lot of these issues when we see illegal activity, illegal apps in the app stores, um, ho content hosted somewhere. It's still crazy, I think, when you have a live match or a live piece of content being streamed from some server in France that you need to wait two days before they take down this particular soccer match, for example. That's, a, that's insane. So it's not really limited to the platform accountability and the kind of companies you've mentioned here. It also goes to hosting provider, ad networks, gambling websites that are kind of using uh, content again, the key content pieces to market their illegal, most of the time illegal sports betting companies. I, th I think it's much broader than just these particular platforms and, uh, and mm -hmm. are they accountable for what's happening on their platforms. I think it's much broader than that. I, st I think there are still some key issues. It goes a little bit to my earlier point of um, how can you compete with these, I mentioned 800, just in the IPTV subscription kind of space where you can get everything for $20, some are more popular than others. How can you really mitigate those um, uh, issues? Uh, and, and that requires more proactivity from more platforms across the globe, not just limited to the, the big companies you've mentioned here. So the big issues that I see as pivots in this particular question are A, um, this whole issue of um, self-regulatory versus not does self-regulatory work, clear disagreement on whether self-regulatory is enough. I sort of think that water's under the bridge because yesterday we have two dozen AGs is what Deccan said today. So let's update our metrics. Um, and so that's the, the big platforms are gonna be regulated in some way. And I think the other big pivot point here, a disagreement area, is what data matters. So sort of everybody agrees data matters, but is it big aggregates? She's not getting anything so anything sounds good to her. I think it's all irrelevant <laughs> unless you have person, person data, like what Netflix has, which is a first party platform. How much did you watch and when did you turn it off? Let's put up the um, Slido and uh, I'm gonna ask people questions and then you can choose between answering my question or you can choose, we can all see the Slido down here so you guys can choose one of those instead. So you have the option. Let me start with Mitch. In what ways does music lead other media silos? That is, what are the key learnings from the music business that other media silos should take, should bake into their thinking as they think about the future? Usually being a leader is a good thing. Uh, the, in, this, in this case, it was sort of canary in the coal mine leadership, not, uh, not leadership is the canary by dead? choice. Um, I would say on content protection, the biggest lesson uh, that was gained from, from peer to peer and what followed is uh, nip new forms of piracy in the bud as quickly as you possibly can. Make sure your rights are secure globally to the extent that you can and enforce in a way early that will, you know, sort of stop an avalanche, you know, uh, like was done with cyber lockers. You know, Kim.com being extradited uh, and in fear of going to jail, that was a pretty good deterrent for people that wanted to start new kind of cyber locker services. And so, uh, stream ripping is the current version in music of that. You know, we had to bring two big stream ripping cases immediately. We had to go to YouTube and beg them, uh, not that it worked very well, uh, <laughs> but to, you know, to stop people from hacking their back door in order to, uh, to take So you think the 70% demise in the value of the music industry was due to piracy? Yes. That's your big learning for everybody Ab else. Don't let piracy happen. Don't let it happen. It okay. is, it is, it is, 
Here's a clue. Don't, that, it's that not Michael about prove, unbundling the album. Yeah, that or. Michael can prove to you. Uh, piracy, people taking your stuff for free in a hits driven business really hurt your business. <laughs> and anybody who says that that's not true is just an ideologue. Uh, doesn't look at evidence. This is evidence-based policy. That's what we're okay. talking about here. <laughs> okay, so the second thing uh, on the licensing side, at least in music, I think the big lesson is license everybody. Don't let there be, at least in a free market where you have some control and you're not being you know, screwed by regulation, license everybody even if uh, you know, it's hard to do because you need all of those voices. You don't want one dominant player controlling everything. You have to have that competition. And in the music world, you have to license your entire catalog. Nobody knows, you know, what label Rihanna is on That's or what true. label Beyonce mm -hmm. is on, yeah, right? She's the brand. We can't have a Disney Plus. We can't, you know, you can't have like just just Columbia Records music service. That's not gonna work. So everybody licenses all their music to all platforms and the differentiation comes with how well do you know your customer? What's your platform look like? Is it intuitive? Uh, can you differentiate based on sort of different factors? So in the music world, I would say, uh, in, when, you can, when you have control in a free market, uh, use it and license everybody and on anti-piracy, nip it in the bud as fast as possible. Okay, so let's go to Jan. Uh, let's move to value leakage and talk about piracy and theft on the back of uh, Mitch's comments. Um, can you talk about trends in value leakage out of the ecosystem and what you think needs to be done on piracy? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, what we are seeing right now is, I, I've mentioned streaming piracy, that's still an issue. You see kind of a shift from streaming website piracy to apps, add-ons related to Kodi. I think we were and are very effective kind of taking action in that particular space, taking the illegal apps, add-ons avail available uh, offline from these marketplaces where people download them and find them. Uh, the shift really uh, is going, I mean, it's, it's shifting towards subscription-based piracy, like I've mentioned before, this one-off fee for an all-you-can-eat kind of approach um, where uh, you will see a big impact uh, to the general businesses across the globe. So what we have learned, kind of to Mitch's point, yes, piracy is absolutely crucial and to tackle as soon as possible when you see kind of these new forms appear. And that's what we are doing with our team of almost 100 people across the globe, of tech experts to kind of focus on these issues, to look ahead, to think what we needs to be done. Will it always be there? Absolutely. But we want to make sure we are driving impactful actions to drive the consumer to legitimate marketplaces to pay a reasonable fee for content. And there's, to my earlier point as well, there's more choice than ever, so that cannot be an excuse anymore. But it's very difficult to compete with a $20 uh, service where you get HBO, ESPN, all the Netflix, all the Amazon Prime content, they rip it, they put it online, uh, and, and you get access to a huge 10,000 title VOD catalog. You cannot compete with that. So we need to tackle those issues. And the good thing for us is that's easier than, for example, BitTorrent piracy or dealing with a streaming website operator based in some difficult jurisdiction where we need to work with it, the Interpols and the Europols of the world. So in, in, in terms of audiovisual piracy, I think the shift is going to, uh, I mean, it's clear that it's going to subscription-based IPTV or however you want to call it, piracy. And what we have learned as well, kind of the last point I want to make, is that you cannot do this alone. So this is not an audiovisual issue. It's not just a music issue. It's across all platforms. It's games. It's everything. These pirates, they, they do everything. They want to make as much money as they can in a short amount of time. So we, together with 40 almost other members, launched the Alliance for Creativity and Entertainment in July 2017, which is a big group of people focusing on the right things in this particular space, joining forces, paying the bill together, focusing with this larger team from the MPAA, as ACE is a, is a website and a spokesperson, but it's the MPAA team that, that's running these content protection actions on a daily basis. And I think that's key, to join forces and to make sure we are looking all in the right direction and, and are not chasing the same suspects and avoid duplication, obviously. So that's a, a big lesson learned from us, and, and, and that's, a, I think, a good thing, and it's a big change in our world. Okay. So, Gene, you can pick one of the questions on Slido, which I guess have disappeared, um, or, or you can address my question, which is Netflix, if friend or foe. Yes. I'll take the Netflix question, and the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, yes to both. Try right, to exactly. Um, <laughs> it wasn't long ago that we were standing arm in arm with Netflix seeking net neutrality and how much f difference five years can make. Um, having said that we miss them in that sense, um, Netflix is putting $13 billion 
into production this year. There is no way that that isn't useful, good, and you know, essentially the, the bloodstream of production in a lot of places. Um, they are, I'm told, much easier to work with than the studios. Uh, they impose almost no creative control. If they like your script, uh, they'll double your budget and send you off into the wilderness to do whatever you want to do. So in that sense, it is very good work for producers. The problem, of course, is you end up owning nothing. So if you wanted a job, you had a great job, you have no back end and you're not you're not building a business. You don't, you don't end up with your IP long term. So it used to be that Netflix would actually have an exclusive license period for seven or 10 years, but then you would own the IP. They exactly. away from that now? Right. OK. And part of it is because they're moving away, as are many of the platforms and studios, toward wanting to totally control their own content and wanting the rights internationally. But the fact is that for a producer, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's great work, um, but it's not building your future in the way you would have liked. Um, but I think the most cogent thing, and of course, we're all aggravated that they're not taking everybody's content, et cetera, et cetera, and whatever. But the most cogent thought a member of mine gave me, um, which I think is worth offering up, is Netflix is important today because it's showing everyone what the standard is for content that will grab the consumer's attention. There is a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of competition from everything, including the infamous cat videos and everything else. What Netflix is succeeding in doing is pushing content, the content that they take and they put out there, toward very high quality, uh, very attention grabbing, but ultimately very, you know, very popular. And the role of being standard setter is important, as everyone is trying to negotiate this marketplace and trying to figure out how do you break through, how do you get people to hear you. They have the best data. Do you think they use it in greenlighting your producer's films? Or I, well, projects? I assume that increasingly they are. I'm, it's not clear to me that when that really started or how effective it is, because of course you have to look at that in the global environment. Okay. But the fact is that they are really showing the world what good quality content looks like, largely short form, but that's fine. If short form is the way consumers want to hear and see their stories, we all need to produce to that, that model. So I think if short form is 10 minutes, you must not mean No, no. We call short form series, television programming. Which is Long form hour? is 90 minutes. 90 minutes. OK, it's so a short picture form film. is 60? No, short form is a series. It's anything that's not a feature film, basically. I see. So, OK, so it's like a series. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that's a different story arc. But if that's the way consumers want content, you have to be able to tell your story that way. So I think that overall, we would conclude that the impact of Netflix today is, if not positive, necessary and inevitable. OK, great. Uh, Mike, let's go to you. Um, I'm just going to find my question. Oh, you can do any of those. Or at Carnegie Mellon, you guys are doing really interesting academic research on consumer viewing behavior in the OTT environment. Can you share some key takeaways from that work? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll take that one then. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, at, at CMU, uh, for the past 10 years, we've, we've run a research center called the Initiative for Digital Entertainment Analytics, where, where we're really trying to, you know, in a, in a world where everything is changing, we believe it's really important to understand what's the consumer doing, what's consumer behavior look like. So two big findings out of that. One is exactly what, what Mitch says, is that piracy, piracy hurts sales, and it hurts sales a lot. So I think the best research says almost all of the 50% to 70% drop in music industry revenue was directly attributable to piracy. Um, we're working on a, a, a review paper of the literature right now. There are 33 peer-reviewed studies in the academic literature looking at the question of does piracy harm sales. 29 of them say yes. And the other four come with some pretty important caveats. It's, it's almost a flat earther debate if you want to mm -hmm. go to the other side. Um, the, the two studies we did most recently look at this notion of, of binge watching. 
Um, so I'll, I'll challenge Gene a little bit on the notion of short firm versus versus long form. Um, David Fincher series versus films. Exactly. Yes. Um, okay. I think a lot of series start to look like really long form. You know, Dave, David Fincher said we approached House of Cards like a 13-hour movie. Um, so how do consumers, how, what does consumer behavior look like in the presence of the ability to binge? And in the past, the, the past year, we've done two what I think are really cool studies on this cool. question. So my colleague Pedro Ferreira worked with a big uh, uh, telco uh, SVOD service and randomly gave some consumers access to binging and some not and then observed on the platform exactly what those people did. And what he found was they binged the content they knew about and then became very, very unlikely to continue to subscribe. Um, mm -hmm. And then he ran another experiment which said, OK, let's randomize what, what information they see. In one, in one form, we're going we're gonna to give the bingers just, here's some stuff that other people find interesting. And then, we're, and then in the other form, we're going to give you, here's some stuff that we think you're going to find very interesting. And in that second form, a lot of the decline in your, in your likelihood of continuing to subscribe went away. In both, on both sides? No, when, when I give you generic recommendations, you, like. yeah, you okay. binge what you want and you disappear. When I give you Data specific by recommendations, yeah. you Data wouldn't by have other. Person matters. Exactly. Um, and so I think for platforms, this tells you two things. One is you've got to have a big, big uh, uh, set of content sitting behind you. And two, you've got to mine that data really well to give me new stuff that I wouldn't have otherwise discovered. Otherwise, I'm going to watch, you know, the, 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 the six Pixar films I would have wanted to and not subscribe to Disney Plus next month. Um, the second study, which, which I think is also really cool, is a colleague of mine, Jeff Gallick, who looks at hedonic decline, which really means you know, as, you, as you do something over and over again, how does your enjoyment of that experience go down? And what he found is in video, we binge too fast. We, mm -hmm. we consume stuff faster than we should for our own personal enjoyment. We would be happier if we actually delayed our consumption oh, yeah. versus what, what we actually do. And again, I think, I think these insights will be really important for everybody else on this panel, uh, I hope. As, well, and I think that's why adapt. it's possible for people to shift from long form to short form, because you yes. can adapt that story arc now right. in a way you couldn't if the short form had to extend over a year. Right. I, I can tell stories that I couldn't have told in a 22-minute right. time slot week after week. Um, and I think that's hugely valuable for everybody. OK, our last question, and then the panel's over, goes to Dar um, Darkara? Yeah. <laughs> Delar. Delar. I like DeLorean. I like the DeLorean. I'm on the panel now. Yeah, yeah, right. So there's a lot of these for, for there are a lot of um, e e sports, esports. Yeah. Although yeah, they, all the sports. questions are esports. Yeah, We're yeah, glad you're here. Are e -sports. Right. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you can take one of those, or sure. I'll give you mine, and okay. you can choose. Um, uh, so let's see. Fortnite appears to have changed the world for video games research, which showed that in 2018, the, U the average US player of Fortnite spent one hour every day watching other play people play Fortnite, plus the time they played. Um, Fortnite has stated that 250 million registered users globally um, averaged, uh, and they averaged 10 million concurrent streams in March of 2019. That came from the CEO of uh, Epic Games, which owns Fortnite. We estimate that Fortnite will report $5 billion of revenue in 2019, even though it's a free-to-play game. How do you see the world of video games evolving over the next three years, and what public policy initiatives yeah. do you think are the most important? So I'll answer a combination of some of those <laughs> questions and your Great. question. Uh, so on a panel yesterday, Dale Hatfield warned against the dangers of hyperbole. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to come out and say that the growth of eSports uh, is phenomenal, and that's not hyperbole. Um, <laughs> So for usually when I give these talks, um, I try to explain what eSports is. eSports is essentially competitive video gaming that uh, is streamed uh, live to others, viewers. And um, depending on the audience, usually I'll get a few chuckles. Um, but people don't necessarily always appreciate the legitimacy and the populari popularity of eSports. Um, the fact of the matter is there's a great deal of non-endemic money being poured into this space. Um, companies are building entire stadiums dedicated to esports, and those stadiums are being 
filled, sold out um, to watch these events. Um, Will cities it be in the Olympics. It's really contentious. Let's talk later. <laughs> we don't know. There, that, that, yeah. um, but th that's Performance the level, dancing at drugs? That's the, that's mm -hmm. the level. Whose side are you guys on? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the level of seriousness that, that folks around the world globally are, are taking the, um, this competitive video gaming. Um, cities are, are in the U.S. are comp um, competing to become the next esports hub. Uh, and uh, well, so there's a question about Twitch. Um, Twitch was founded in 2011. It was bought by Amazon in 2014 for $970 million, I believe it was. Um, and now in 2019, there have been over 345 billion minutes watched. So uh, I think a resounding yes to the question, um, is this, is this going to be a, a huge aspect? I don't know about control, but a huge aspect of the entertainment market going forward. The end. <laughs> the end. So did Fortnite change the world? Yes. Well, actually, it's her question. <laughs> oh, sorry. Was that out loud? No, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to see what you think. I mean, Why do you think it changed Oh, no, the world? I, I, think, I think about 40% of those billions of minutes were consumed by, by my two teenage sons. <laughs> uh, I, what, what I think is, is really cool is if you were to pitch this idea, people are going to watch other people watching mm. video games. It's so clearly a stupid idea. <laughs> It'll never work. And yet, it works, it works brilliantly. I mean, so, so what I'm saying is, in, in this world where we can try a whole bunch of different things, we're going to discover stuff like mm. eSports that you, many people wouldn't think would work that's actually going to work brilliantly. And to loop it back around, are the rights secured for live streaming? Say it again. Are the rights secured mm. for live streaming? A really interesting yeah. question. Can we have real enforcement <laughs> for live streaming? If this is what's going to become one of the most popular drivers of entertainment in the future, you have to ask the question, are the yeah, rights in that area secured and is, force, is, is, and is enforceability allowed? Because you know what investors want to know? They want to know, is your intellectual property secure and can you enforce your rights? Because no rights mm -hmm. means nothing. No remedies means you have nothing. And so if you want to attract capital, just like any startup in Silicon Valley wants to attract capital, they're going to say to any company in Silicon Valley, do you have your patents? Can you enforce them? That's how you're going to give your money. In live streaming, are the rights secure? And can you enforce them? That's going to dictate whether or not that's successful as a future form of entertainment. Right. Quickly. quickly. And, and enforce them quickly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, my point of view on this whole, on Fortnite and why it changed the world is I think the video game space until Fortnite is the last, they haven't democratized yet. It's all, you have to have a $400 console so you can pay $60 to play a game. It is the bastion of the wealthy. And I think that needs to end. I disagree with that. Okay, Strong. good. <laughs> disagree with the that. The shift is towards Fortnite. streaming video games. Um, the shift is you don't necessarily have to have the hardware. You can if you want. I don't think it's putting an end to consoles at all. There's been a lot of talk about in the press. Um, the Nintendo Switch just came out. Hugely, hugely, hugely popular handheld consoles for those of you who don't have one yet. <laughs> um, uh, but, but the shift is towards streaming, streaming on your mobile devices. Um, that ability to stream when you want, where you want, on the go. Sort of like reminds me of the, the the TV anywhere, so it's mm -hmm. on it's video games anywhere. So, but I think my point would be, you don't watch a game unless you also play it. It no, is probably uh, common. There are different reasons, I think. Fine, but usually people play the game and then they watch people who play it better to sort of get hints and because they really appreciate the sure, fineness yeah. of the play, yeah. which means you have to have played the game. My point of view mm -hmm. is that Fortnite, because it was a free-to-play game mm -hmm. on every platform, let 250 million people play and then they could play with their friends. Mm -hmm. And the point is, they lowered the barrier to entry. Yeah. They will make $5 billion this year. That is larger than electronic arts total revenue which means they've democratized video games. That is the most important thing going on in the video game space, in my opinion, is you're yeah. taking it out of the hands of the wealthy. Yeah, absolutely. And proving, yeah. and by the way, it, it may be that those people get disrupted because they aren't willing to undermine Call of Duty and Overwatch mm -hmm. and these things they, pay six, they get $60 for. But I think that's the importance of Fortnite, is we need democratize it. We need ad-driven ad driven it's not in their case it's in game purchases exactly. but it's free to players and out of the 250 million people they say 70% of people say they've spent money at a 50 cents or a dollar in the game on Fortnite lots of people mm. play it for free that is a good use of media and that's what i think the importance of Fortnite is in your space well said well i don't know it's just my point of view yeah make anyway, sure you get that on tape any questions from the audience before we call it we're right on time oh good okay, okay.
we will call it there then. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your time. So we'll take a 10 minute break and then come back for a panel on the fractured internet, why the internet is falling apart around the world and what we can do